Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. We're continuing on in a, a series. Um, the Bible has no errors. Open your Bibles, please, to the book of Psalms, chapter 12. We've read this verse the last couple weeks. We'll read it again tonight. We've also read um, 2 Timothy 3.16. Uh, we won't read that one tonight. We're going to read a different verse. But let's read this one first. Psalms 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. It's very, very important that we read the Bible uh, as it is and not change it. And when you change it, you will get a message other than the one God intended for you. And so when you get a Bible that has been changed, then somebody has meddled with God's message for you. They are not your friend. They're not a good person. They may seem sincere. They may seem kind and everything. But uh, they are not doing you a favor. For example, if the doctor said, uh, ask somebody to please tell you you had a very serious disease and you needed to take some medicine, and if you didn't take the medicine, you would die, and that person decided to change that message and say, the doctor said, you know, you're sick, but you're going to be okay. They changed the message. Um, that doesn't help you. They're not doing you a favor. They're, they're not sparing your feelings. Um, they're contributing to your death, and, and uh, uh, it sounds awful mean and awful harsh, uh, but we have no right to tamper with God's words, and those that do um, uh, ought not to. They're, they're meddling with, with people's eternal souls. The Bible tells us the words of the Lord are pure words. There's an argument going around, well, the originals, those were pure, and They've been lost over the thousands of years, and as it's been transmitted down, uh, there's been copyist errors that have crept in because it's all had to be copied by hand. And uh, uh, the, the fact of the matter is, those that were entrusted with, with doing that uh, started training from childhood, very early trial, uh, childhood. And they trained from that, not so that they might be able to do that as an adult, but it was decided you're going to be a scribe and your sole duty, your, your whole purpose in life is going to be to make copies of God's word. And they had very uh, specific techniques that they used. They counted the letters on the page um, <clears throat> and each page had a certain number of letters. Uh, so they would count through, they knew what the middle of, uh, letter of the page was. And so they would, they would check, uh, even if, if the number of letters was correct, uh, they would check, is the, is the center letter correct? And if there was an error, they'd throw the whole thing away. They wouldn't scratch something out and then correct it. They'd just do away with that sheet and, and start all over again. There was no hurry. Uh, what was important was a meticulous, exact replica. Uh, and so when we get to this Psalms 12, uh, you say, well, well, David was saying that what he had was, was pure. Well, remember, David was but a pen in God's hand. God was saying that what David had was pure. And all that David, David had at that time was a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. And yet God doesn't say the words of the Lord were pure words. At some point, they used to be. At this point, remember, all that David has, the best that he has is, is uh, several generations down the line of copies. And God said they are still pure. They're still pure. Turn with me to 1 Peter. Uh, I'm sorry, Second uh, Peter. Uh, you can go to 1 Peter and then keep, keep going past that to 2 Peter. And we're going to look at chapter 1. First Peter, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. And so what it's saying here is basically David didn't just decide to write a psalm. Moses didn't just decide to write a book or five books, as it were. Uh, <clears throat> and so it's saying these, these men 
this wasn't something that they came up with. Isaiah didn't come up with the words that, that he preached and that he gave, uh, that he wrote down. Uh, so verse 20 again, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so they spake, they delivered a message, they wrote literally as the Holy Spirit of God moved them, spoke through them, wrote through them. And so, uh, you know, they didn't claim those to be their own words. So having just kind of said that as, as by way of introduction, let's pray and we'll get uh, uh, started or we'll continue into the study uh, that we've been looking over, uh, things that look like contradictions in the Bible and that sometimes somebody may bring to you and say, look here, these two things say two different things. Uh, that's a contradiction, and uh, if, if you say, I've already seen that, and here's why it's not a contradiction. Uh, you can be better equipped as a Christian. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. It's purity, it's perfection, it's trustworthiness, and God, may our faith in it uh, not just endure, but grow stronger and stronger uh, the more we read it and study it, the more we know about it. Uh, may it lead us to know more about you. We ask that you give us understanding uh, and knowledge as a result of these studies. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so last week we left off with uh, uh, <clears throat> should the word Easter be used in the Bible? The King James Bible is the one that has Easter. Other, other books that are versions instead of translations leave out the word Easter and they use the word Passover, and that is a mistake. Uh, that's that's not a correct translation of it. Now, we get started into uh, tonight, as I think I mentioned last week, I said next week we'll look at uh, how did King Saul die. Turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. Uh, and chapter 31. 1 Samuel chapter 31. And we're going to start in verse 4. So this is the last chapter of 1 Samuel. Chapter 31, <clears throat> uh, we'll just start in verse 1. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and uh, Abinadab and uh, Malkishua, Saul's sons. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hid him. And he was sore wounded of the archers. Verse 4. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword, and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through, and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. Uh, in verse 5. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. And so here the Bible tells us that Saul was injured. Uh, the enemy archers uh, hit him. He's injured. Uh, the battle was not going well for the Israelites. And it looked like the enemy was going to win this battle. And he did not want to fall into their hands and have them abuse him and beat him and mock him and parade him through uh, injured and, and continue just to uh, injure him until they killed him slowly. Uh, and so he tells his armor bearer, he says, take out your sword, kill me. And his armor bearer says, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. His armor bearer rightfully said, I'm not going to lift my hand against the man that uh, God has put on the throne. And he said, I'm not going to do this. So Saul takes out his own sword and he falls upon it and kills himself. And that's what the Bible tells us here in 1 Samuel chapter 31. Now go forward just a, a page or so. To 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 8. <clears throat> and he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. Uh, let's back up a little bit. Um, let's see. Uh, let's just uh, back up to verse 1. 2 Samuel chapter 1 verse 1. Now it came to pass... After the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had abode two days in Ziklag, it came to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. And so it was, 
when he came to David, that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. And David said unto him, From whence comest thou? He said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto him, How went the matter, I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, That the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people also are fallen and dead, and Saul and Jonathan his son are dead also. And David said unto the young man that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan his son be dead? And the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon uh, his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me, and I answered, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. He said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish is come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head, and the bracelet that was on his arm, and it brought them hither unto my Lord. Uh, <clears throat> so it looks like, how did Saul die? Did Saul kill himself? Or did this Amalekite happen upon him and Saul say, uh, would you please just kill me? And, and the Amalekite says, sure. And he stands up on him and, and runs him through this. Which is, here's this Amalekite. He's of the enemy. And he's thinking, okay, here's David. He's, the, he's really the man that, uh, uh, to be reckoned with now that Saul's dead. And it's clear that he is the man who knows how to command people and win battles. And so he's going to be next in line to be the, the, uh, on the throne, the, the next king. And so I want to get in his good graces. And so he lies about how Saul died. And he says, look here, I've got his crown. I've got some, some bracelets, some jewelry from him, uh, some things that used to belong to him. And he's hoping to get in to David's good graces. It's clear, here's a fellow that's telling a story about what happened. And that's all it is, is a story. It's a lie about, there's no contradiction here. Uh, the Amalekite is just lying in hopes that David will reward him for paving the way for him to be the king. Uh, so not a contradiction at all. Now let's go to the book of Jonah, chapter 1. <clears throat> and we'll look at the next one. Jonah, chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1, right after the book of Obadiah, which is one chapter long. And Obadiah is right after Amos. And just before the book of Micah, it's kind of tucked in there. Jonah's not a real long book, but chapter 1, verse 7, says, And they said, Everyone to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Uh, let's read on. Then said they unto him, Tell us, uh, <clears throat> we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation, and whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? So he tells them, I'm Hebrew, I worship the real God, and I've disobeyed, and this is why uh, he's come after me. Now, let's go forward to verse 17 here. And it says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then look at chapter 2, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. So here in the book of Jonah, three different times, this beast, this sea creature, is called a fish. Now let's go to the book of Matthew, chapter 12, in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40. The Bible says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Matthew says it's a whale. Jonah says it's a fish. And people say, look, that's a contradiction. Everybody knows that a whale is not a fish. 
Well, in the biblical classification system, it is. In the biblical classification, a dolphin would be considered a fish. Sea swimming creatures like that are considered fish. Uh, we, we need to be careful not to force Carl Linnaeus's animal classification system onto the Bible. When you go to a modern-day science book, that system is really not all that old. Uh, it's within the last few hundred years that that classification system came about. And so if you go back in time uh, to the time in which the book of Matthew was given to us, uh, when Matthew the tax collector was walking around this world, if they would have pulled a whale out of the ocean, they would have all called it a fish. Uh, they would have said, look at that great big fish. If they'd have pulled a shark out, they'd have said, look at that big fish. Look at all those teeth. If they'd have pulled a dolphin out, they'd have said, look at that. Look at that fish. That, that's a funny looking fish. A big old long nose. Um, if they'd have pulled a, a freshwater dolphin out, uh, which, which they do exist. And some of them are, are pink. And just the weirdest looking thing to see pink dolphins swimming and jumping out of the water in, in the river. They'd have said, that's an odd looking fish. Uh, and so we have to be careful not to put our own ideas and systems and try to force them upon the Bible. And we've got to try to, we, we must be careful not to force the Bible into man-made systems. And, and uh, here's another thought, and, and I'm not saying that this is the animal uh, that swallowed Jonah, but there is a beast, uh, <coughs> I guess you'd call it a beast, a, a, a seafaring creature called a whale shark. Well, sharks are fish, whales are not fish. So which is it? Is that a fish? Is it not a fish? It's called a whale shark. The whale shark has an interesting way of eating. It just opens its mouth and swallows. It doesn't take a bite out of it. Now, a regular shark, it'll bump something to see, hmm, is that food? It'll bump it, and it might take just kind of a, a, a slight bite out of something to see if it's food. And then if it decides, I think that is food, then it's going to come back and, and become more aggressive, and it's going to bite and, and try to tear flesh off and, and go to town on you. And, and so if you're ever swimming out in the ocean uh, and you feel something come up and bump you, well, that might have been a shark. Uh, now, it might just be a piece of driftwood that happened to be uh, floating by or, or moving along, uh, but that's the way sharks kind of explore their world. Uh, to, is that food? Uh, let's bump it and see. Let's take a little bit of a bite. Let's let's just bite down on it and see. It, oh no, that's a piece of metal. I don't want to. I don't want to bite down very hard on that. So I'll leave that alone. Uh, oh no, that that feels like flesh. I will go ahead and bite down and take a chunk out. Uh, but a whale shark doesn't do that. It just opens up its mouth and just gulps its food down. Doesn't chew. Doesn't do any of that stuff. It just opens up whatever's in front of it. It just swallows it down and holds it in its stomach. Its stomach then goes to work trying to digest. And whatever it can digest, it digests. And whatever it cannot digest, a whale shark will regurgitate. It just throws it back up. And we know that Jonah was swallowed. He wasn't, he wasn't bitten and chewed up and then swallowed. He was swallowed whole. He was in the, the belly of that beast whether it was a whale, a shark, a fish, or whatever. He was there for three days and three nights, and then God commanded that animal to throw Jonah up, and so he did. And so um, it could it have been a whale shark? I, I don't know, maybe. Uh, could it have been an animal that uh, has never been seen since then and was never seen before? It very well could have been that, because the Bible says that God himself prepared a specific fish or seafaring animal for this purpose, and, and brought that animal uh, to where Jonah was and had him swallow him. So there's no contradiction here. It's, it's, a, it's a lack of man's understanding, or it's an attempt of man to force his own template onto the Bible, or force the Bible into his template, and, and those two things just don't go. Um, and so let's look at another one. Uh, <clears throat> let's look at Leviticus chapter 11. Here's an interesting one. Leviticus 11. And we'll start in verse 21. Uh, 21 through 23, I believe, is what we're going to look at. Leviticus 11. I 
and verse 21 says, Yet these may, uh, these may ye eat of every flying, creeping thing that goeth upon all four, which have legs above their feet, to leap withal upon the earth. Verse 22, Even these of them ye may eat, the locusts after his kind, and the bald locusts after his kind. So the locusts that that has a nice full head of hair, that's fine. The bald locust, no, I don't, I don't think locusts have hair, but evidently there's one that's called a bald locust, after his kind, and the beetle after his kind, and the grasshopper after his kind. But all other flying, creeping things which have four legs shall be an abomination unto you. And people say, see there, the Bible says that, that insects have four legs, and we all know insects have six legs. Well, how many legs do spiders have? Well, that's simple. Spiders aren't insects. They're a whole different animal, a uh, whole different bug. They have eight legs. Okay, let's go over to the book of Proverbs, chapter 30. Proverbs, chapter 30. And look at verse 28 here. The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's places, or king's palaces. The spider taketh hold with her hands. So we look at a spider and we see eight appendages. But you know, it could be that the four back ones are legs and the four front ones are arms and hands. You know, you don't need eight to be able to walk. I looked up a video of, of a spider wrapping up its meal, packing its lunch for later. <laughs> and it was very interesting because this spider had, had, already, had already put its prey to sleep. And it was, uh, I don't know, looked to be about the size of a, of a stink bug. Uh, but the spider was holding on to its web with one leg. And it was using the other seven to hold on to the insect. And it was spinning that insect. It, it had already put its, its web on it. And so it's feeding more web out as it's, it's, it's just spinning and just wrapping this thing up. Kind of like in a cocoon. And so in that case, it, had, it was hanging by, was it hanging by its foot? Was it hanging by its hand? Monkeys can hang by their feet. And hold on to things and do things with their hands. Uh, some some monkeys, when they run, they will use all fours. Do they have four feet, or do they have two feet and two hands? And so we look at an insect and we think, well, since it's using all eight or all six of its, uh, we'll say appendages, to move about, to run, to to do whatever, then those all have to be legs. Well, not necessarily. And, and understand <clears throat> that God doesn't necessarily view things the way we view things. And if you, you know, God looks at us and he says, he thinks spiders have eight legs. Isn't that cute? The same way we look at a child and the child, you know, two or three year old has a very unique way of looking at things. And, um, uh, you know, my, my wife babysits uh, our, our two of our nieces and a nephew. And the, the nephew and one of the niece, they're very young. And uh, they end up at our house after I've left for work. And sometimes I get off work early enough and they're still there. And they think I'm just visiting that house like they are. Like they show up and then they leave and they go to their actual house. <laughs> and it's they don't quite understand that that's my house. I live there. And so, well, are they are they really wrong? Well, they just have a different perspective of things, and they're mistaken. That's that's my house. That's where I live, and uh, they think I live somewhere else, and that I visit there just the way they live somewhere else, and they come there and visit. Well, uh, we look at them. We say that's that's kind of cute. That's kind of funny and everything. And then we look at a spider. And say it's got eight legs. 
And God looks at us and says, that's kind of cute. Isn't that funny? They think spiders have eight legs. When we all know some of those are hands. How does God know some of those are hands? God made it. God designed it. And he said it's going to produce web from this end. And it's going to use, and by the way, different spiders use different uh, uh, species of spiders, if you will, use their legs differently. Some of them spin webs. Some of them dig a hole in the ground. And they bury themselves in that hole and put a little lid over the hole. And they wait till they feel something walking by. They jump up out of the hole. And they, they grab their prey with their feet. That doesn't sound right. But if I said it grabs its prey with its hands, that would sound that would sound more right. And by the way, it would also be biblical. And, and so <clears throat> to, to say, when, when people start nitpicking like this, when you have to go to something like that, first of all, it's a matter of perspective. Uh, second of all, it, it's, a, it's a faulty assumption. Faulty assumption. And, and so, uh, you know, raccoons, they go along on all fours. But they can also stand upright. They can also grip things with their hands. They can pick something up and they can, uh, they can unwrap a piece of candy with their fingers. They have that dexterity. Um, and uh, put it in some water and wash it off if they want to. And, and uh, they... they they can do that. Now, so we might say a raccoon has two hands. Well, hands are attached to arms, aren't they? And it has two legs. But a dog, we wouldn't say they have two hands and two legs. They don't grip anything with any of their paws. I mean, they might grip something between their paws, uh, might hold onto a bone while they're chewing on it like that. So somebody might say, well, it's, it's using its hands. Um, just different ways of looking at things. And then the scientist comes along and says, we are not going to call those hands. Well, that doesn't make you right. That just means you're not going to call those hands. Uh, <clears throat> and you and your group of pals don't have to call them hands. Uh, but that doesn't mean you're superior to somebody else who says, I'm going to call them hands. Uh, because they're serving the purpose of a hand right now. Uh, but, so here's some, some, some things that people have perceived to be contradictions and errors in the Bible. And truly they're not when you just look at it and let it say what it says. And when you consider uh, the author of it and the perspective of the author, God, and God's perspective, you realize there's no error. There's no mistakes. There's no contradictions. And it is wonderful to have a book that we can hold on to and we can look to and know everything in that book is pure and from God. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer tonight. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us your pure word and preserving it for us. And God, thank you for bringing it over into the English language for us that we may study it and know it and more importantly, know you. We pray that you'd help us to do so. We pray for your Holy Spirit to uh, open our eyes to it and give us understanding, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless and keep you.